Mr. Tim Nicholl, uh, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor at John Moores University in Liverpool in the UK. Um, can I welcome my fellow panelists to the session? Um, they'll introduce themselves in due course, and also we welcome those who will join us as we go through the discussion. Um, the title of the session today is The Granting of Leadership. And in the time we've come together, we've been invited to explore the nature of leadership and also fellowship and perhaps explore what legitimizes the leader's permission, decision, sort of position and decision making powers. Um, I just wanted to note very briefly, it's an important topic in the context of both politics and organizations at present. In the political world, we're faced currently with two very stark images of leadership. We have a, a first of all, that image of a state sponsored dictatorship, where freedom of expression, political thought very much restricted, where the organs of state, especially the security uh, functions, seem to be critical to the retention and the exercise of power. Against that, alternatively, we see a leader democratically elected, seeking to maintain concepts of national identity, national morale in very extreme circumstances, and by extension, promoting values and concerns which are the basis of um, liberalism that we've developed over centuries in, um, in Western Europe. But interestingly for me, we see too this groundswell of support at the level of the individual, at the level of communities. And I've, I've never lived in a time when um, another nation's flag has been flown so much um, in my own country. And nor um, have I seen a continent come together, as we have seen, to embrace uh, people from a different nation. And I think we've seen how business leaders and political leaders in many respects have, have been forced to catch up almost and respond to that grand swell of popular opinion. And I think this is very relevant for our discussion. I would note too, finally, before we, we move on, just um, how access to information, access to social media has very much made us all broadcasters and all opinion seekers. And I think this challenges the traditional sources of power and also the way in which power is exercised. I think in particular of the profound effect of the uh, Black Lives Matters movement globally and the debate and the action um, the movement has initiated in a huge number of areas, including business, in politics, in education, and in sport. I therefore um, really look very much forward to the debate and the discussion. And um, what I'm going to do is ask my fellow panelists in turn to introduce themselves and then present their thoughts for five to seven minutes, after which we'll broaden the discussion. Um, once we're joined by those, I'm, I'm going to uh, invite those, if they wish to join us, to ask any questions. We may be joined by people who may wish to take the mic as well, so I'll invite them to speak too, should they wish to do so. But thank you, uh, fellow panellists. Um, could we begin, Jan, would you like to introduce yourself first and then um, present your, your thoughts on this topic? Okay, thank you, uh, Tim. It's really a pleasure to participate in this session. I myself, I'm based in Amsterdam uh, and I'm chairing the International Trade and Investment Center. Um, consisting of about 13,000 members worldwide. Um, you know, I, I wanted to speak about leadership and the power of the leaders. And I think the power of a leader is given him to him in many cases, unfortunately, um, given to him by the people. So he has a duty to engage and listen more attentively and carefully to the aspirations of the people, hasn't he not? He should really do so, shouldn't he? A leader has to convey uh, appropriate attitudes, develop effective interpersonal skills and empower followers. And I think a vision and values are very important for granting leadership. And a vision can be defined as a concise statement of the direction in which a group or an organization or politicians and people are headed. But a vision should be desirable and attainable. And an effective vision is specific enough to provide real guidance to people. But can also be uh, a bit vague enough to encourage initiative and remain relevant under certain 
conditions. And I think vision without action is a daydream. And actions speak louder than words and talk does not cook rice. That is what my Chinese friends and partners tell me all the time. Really, talk doesn't cook rice. However, action without vision is a nightmare. That's what the Japanese tell me all the time. When I was living in Japan, they always told us, you know, action without a vision is a nightmare. So policymakers and we ourselves, we need a vision. And we can discuss this uh, and uh, we can come back to this, uh, for instance, um, also discussed today during the Horasis meetings, um, we need also a vision about climate change. And I come back to this later, but I also told you and I mentioned values, fundamental beliefs regarding a person's predisposition to manage or to lead. And I was taught at several international business schools before becoming a partner with EY. The real leader has no need to lead. He is content to point the way. However, my personal experiences show that this is not sufficient. And personally, I also learned the following. It is true that integrity alone won't make somebody a leader. But without integrity, you will never be one. Now, after all the changes in the geopolitical scene, I put a question mark at this statement. Is it really so that integrity alone won't make somebody a leader, but without integrity, you will never be one? So that's one of my questions. Is that really happening at this point in time? Tim? Great. Thank you very much. I think that's really the scene for a very interesting discussion. The, the focus around values, around vision, around integrity, um, and around action as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's some, um, some really interesting thoughts which we will develop. I wonder, Manuela, would you like to pick those up? Would you like to introduce yourself and then and take the discussion further? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, as well. Um, so I am a consultant these days after many years in banking between Milan, London and, and Zurich for the past 11 years. Today, I'm a consultant on strategic marketing and communication. Um, I work mostly within financial services, specialize in uh, fintech and social and economic trends. And my work really, especially in the past five years, has spanned from projects on financial well-being to responsible leadership, but also to media education, um, which are actually closely interlinked. And I think Jan touched on, on a few points, and, and we will probably touch on this again later. Um, I've often wondered, you know, what makes a good leader? You know, all my years in different countries, different cultures, different companies, um, who is a good leader? How do you make one? How do you recognize one? How do you grant leadership to some? And, 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 and how does somebody become a follower rather than a leader? So I think we could all agree on, on, on what Ian said, but also on the fact that these days, especially these days, to be a good leader, you need competence, real competence. Integrity, yes, of course, but it's not enough. Humility and emotional intelligence. And more and more we see, you know, the, the value and the importance of EQ versus IQ. Um, but too often as humans, our, our human nature makes us fall and, and grant leadership too for, you know, to people who are overconfident, narcissistic often, let's think of some politicians and, and charismatic. Um, we, we can discuss charisma a little bit more in detail, but it's always been a double-edged sword. You need charisma for people to follow you, but too much charisma can also backfire, and it does backfire. So why do we follow charisma? Why are we attracted by, by certain personality and certain traits in people? Um, 
charisma is important for leaders because it gets people to like you, to trust you, to, to want to be led by you. It can determine whether in a company, for example, you're seen as a follower or a leader, whether your ideas will be, will be taken up, adopted, your projects will be implemented, how much buy-in you have with your colleagues, with your bosses. And it can be very, very powerful. It can be used well. It's often based on, on presence, on your power, on, on warmth, if we think also again of some politicians. Mm -hmm. and, and also it's based on, on body language. There is a famous experiment that was run by the MIT Media Lab. And in this experiment, they were able to predict, predict the outcome of business conversations and negotiations, sales calls and business plan pitches with 87% accuracy without listening to a single word of content that was being said. It was only done by analyzing the voice fluctuation and the facial expression, the expression of the person that was pitching. So body language, that's how powerful it can be. Um, you almost don't need to speak, right? So charisma. But don't we perhaps these days need to be able to understand how much charisma do we really need in a leader and, and how much humility? And, and where is that fine line? And how personality also, shape, our personality shapes our choices of leaders and what can institutions and governments and the media industry do? To, to, to drive this? And can they and should they drive this? And democracies, perhaps, but what about other forms of government? So we know that, that some of the best leaders are humble rather than, than charismatic. Some of them are even boring. I mean, let's think of a movie on Angela Merkel and, and, and his, her life on a daily basis. It's not, you know, a blockbuster probably because she is steady, she is humble, she, is, uh, she does the job. She gets her job done properly. So um, there are incorporations, for example, we've seen probably all of us over the years, uh, the role of, of um, HR, DNI. There is also a lot of organization of psychologists. They have often use science and technology to predict and also understand human behavior at work. And one of the areas they study is the relationship between the personality of the person and leadership and often how personality shapes our choices and how these, the, the leaders or those leaders will like to impact the organization. And we've seen that, you know, often, and I'm not a psychologist myself, I've worked very closely, very often in large organizations with the HR teams, the NI teams, although this was never my, my, my core area. But I developed a passion because I understood and I realized the impact, positive and negative, that leaders we choose and we and 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 we move push forward, can bring uh, to the organization or not. And often, as as employees, but also as as voters, as population, we have an, an inability to distinguish between confidence and competence, especially in some sectors. Think finance, or or tech. No, and and often we assume that confident people have more potential for leadership because because they 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 are simply better at probably expressing themselves. But when it comes to talent, um, there is very little overlap between you know confidence and leadership. So g talented people often are actually not um, not too charismatic. They're 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 quieter. They're 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 not so much in your face, and. Um, we, we, we have seemed to have liked, you know, especially probably since the age of social media, to have followed a lot more uh, people who seem to express and, and to have a lot of uh, charisma on, on digitally. And this has obviously not helped. So we have now find ourselves in, 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 in a situation where we where it is very difficult to understand how to change this. And this is why what I was mentioning earlier, the role that media and media education at government level, but also corporate level, public and private, the role of media and of media education these days is increasingly important. Mm -hmm. um, if we think of how social media was used or abused for certain you know, political developments of the past few years, it's easy to understand why we really need to probably get this equation of how media is used and social media used a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a little bit, you know, the angle that I'm, um, I, I love to explore a little bit more and, and to know um, what our colleagues think about. Thank you very much. I think that's a, a very broad introduction to describe the, the complexity often. I, I like the, the point that you're you're bringing out around the, the discerning nature of the following, how we need to support that. I think there's some fascinating things to pick up on. I think, could I now go to Jean-Pierre? Because 
in the context of, of that very broad introduction, it really would be interesting to pick on the ideas of adaptability and agility that you've um, we've been talking about in the preparations for this. So, Jean-Pierre, could I hand over to you, good self, please? Uh, well, I'm um, Jean-Pierre Cubizol from uh, Switzerland. At the beginning, I wanted to talk about the CV, but finally, <coughs> I, um, <clears throat> I looked at uh, the opening of the Cannes Festival yesterday, and there was just a beautiful uh, speech of uh, Vincent Landon, who's um, one of uh, the actor and the president, and he said, the planet is bleeding and in severe pain. And he was talking about, uh, you know, the situation of Ukraine. He was talking about the Yemen. He was talking about North Korea. He was talking all about all those places. Some are clearly under leadership or certain leadership. Um, I mean, who would have thought that the president of Ukraine would have been such a leader? Uh, how would have thought about um, Darfur to be such silence? Uh, how would have thought uh, Palestine? We are, uh, you know, more 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 experienced about uh, you know the use of uh, leadership, particularly when it comes down to um, communication. Um, I'm specialized in um, in health policy um, at the national level, and what we learned from COVID nineteen was that. Um, uh, top-down top organization, um, so every centralized organization, and if we looked at France with extremely centralized, Germany was a bit decentralized, Switzerland was clearly decentralized, uh, we have different type of leadership. So leadership is also a question in the environment in which you are, uh, you are living in. I guess living in Russia today, talking about leadership is different uh, than probably any other country um, because the leader is not even informed of what's happening in his, um, in his territory. And then we started to, um, to link the subject of risk and the subject of leadership. Okay. Um, and I look at the World Economic Forum which is the competition of Oasis, <coughs> a sort of. They have a report on, uh, they have a survey on the question of uh, perception of risk uh, as you conduct your business. Okay. And um, they are looking at, on short term, they are looking at, at, uh, at the long term. And what, what we can see is... Um, and a, not in a particular order, but climate is uh, one of the top uh, severe atmospheric type of things. Livelihood is also uh, a subject. Geoeconomics, if we uh, if we look at uh, you know the news today, um, uh, we are confronted uh, to um, to different type of uh, leadership. Um, and then we see a significant uh, divergence uh, will, um, with impact on uh, the leadership ability to tackle common challenges as well as very complex challenges. And that's the work of uh, leaders, uh, either be political uh, because they have an influence on the long term, they should be. I'm not sure they uh, they do it effectively. Um, and um, the public sector, um, which is not very much the same as um, uh, as a political sector, and obviously the normal business, depending on a, uh, on a business sector we are uh, we are in. As far as the climate is concerned, uh, the, um, the specialists are not very positive on what's happening. Uh, they even say that we haven't even started 
to um, to get involved into the subject of adapting uh, the, the famous 17 SDG into their own business. At the same time, the United Nations uh, didn't even, I mean, they listed the 17, they listed what it means over time, particularly on the horizon of uh, 2030, but they didn't put the measurement criteria to say, okay, we have this SDG1, which is malnutrition. Uh, how are we going to assess this? Well, that's quite easy because we can count uh, the people who are dying from malnutrition. Okay, But that's not very positive. Uh, we have other ways to, uh, to look at um, leading a particular objective, leading a particular vision of saying we want to um, we really want to get rid of malnutrition or even starvation uh, over time. So basically, um, uh, when it comes uh, come down to leadership, um, we need to look at the threat of uh, everything. I just remind you that uh, the SP500 uh, lost yesterday uh, more than anything since June uh, 2020. Okay, so leadership is also uh, confronted with a lot of surprise, a lot of short term. Um, can we say that the war, the invasion of uh, Russia by, uh, you know, of Ukraine was something we could plan? Most probably we could have anticipated a little bit, but everybody was surprised. Um, the yeah. same with COVID-19. So I think um, that we are still have some signs, because if I finish by saying that having a adaptive and agile leadership um, with a uh, leadership agenda, uh, you have been talking about empathy, you have been talking about adaptive, assertiveness, communication, team, team activation, or participation or involvement uh, of people within a decision. I just finished by a kind of positive things. Uh, COVID-19 has learned us a lot of things. First, we came down in a very short period of time to a shared vision, okay, which was just to get rid of uh, the pandemic. Um, although we had problems at the beginning with masks, with all kinds of things, in a very short time, uh, we had a vaccine. Mm -hmm. In a very short time, uh, we had uh, treatments. Now, we can discuss uh, which is the best one in the world, but that's not the issue. We had it and we avoid many problems. Uh, and we needed the leadership for doing this, which was unseen in um, the health sector. And if we talk about Russia, uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, the share, we, we find the shared vision, shared vision among the Europeans, amongst uh, NATO countries. Um, we have a shared vision. Um, which is a question, back to Jan, the vision of what we want over time or what we don't want over time. Um, international communication, it's a, it's a, I, I think military schools, I mean, high military schools will use uh, this particular war between um, Russia and Ukraine invasion, if we want to be precise. Uh, there will be case studies. Because it's critical. I mean, I had an office in Kiev uh, for many years. Um, I haven't seen people so engaged, so quality oriented, so achievement oriented, so creative. I mean, those people are buying drones uh, from, uh, you know, toys shops. Yeah. Okay, transform it and make it difficult to yeah. people who had, you know, the, the, the so-called best army in the world. 
<laughs> so that's the question of innovation, creativity, and all that that we need to look at uh, uh, leadership. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. I think what's really interesting you take us away from the, the characteristics of leadership to the issues of leadership and perhaps challenge us to think about how leaders within organizations can change makers in a much more broader sense than just in the context of their organization. And I think it is very important that we understand the, the, the externality that context is changing because of, of uh, particularly climate change, particularly because of poverty, etc. So thank you for introducing that concept. And then I know we'll be picking up on that in more detail. Um, so Matty, could I could finally come to your good self for your introduction? Yes, thank you, Tim. So uh, I come from the Olympic uh, sphere. I've always worked with Olympic athletes and still do. But at some, some point, I realized there is uh, much more we could do with the expertise we put at hand with the Olympic athletes. And we could turn them towards the people who are in positions to make big decisions and to have big impact. Because we believe that uh, the company I founded, we believe that our bio biological system is a communicating vessel system, um, which means that we have to cr create a cognitive output but the athletes create a physical output. Then in, in essence, how we biologically influence the system is the same. So we can use a lot of the expertise from the Olympics and put it into the captains of industry and society who consciously choose to make a positive difference in the world. And that's what we do. We try to maximize our capacity by using those Olympic performance uh, systems and strategies. Um, and hence, we try to use th that expertise to magnify the, the, the impact we can have on the planet. So when I uh, listened to all of you and when I read uh, the statements about this topic, I had to think about the, let's say, two types of, we could call them successful leaders at the Olympic Games. And on one, on one side, you have the, the leaders who who create remarkable and sustainable results. And you have, on the other hand, you have the leaders who create remarkable yet not sustainable results. And for me, in my opinion, a big difference there is the belief system which they use to operate with. And with the belief system, for me, it is the core of the process. It's the driving factor of the process or the system that will eventually generate some outcome. So it is the core of every behavioral change or every behavior uh, mm -hmm. as such. So I see that the, the, the serial medal winners, the ones who create sustainable, remarkable results, they operate from a positive belief, from a belief in abundance in their systems. And the, the one-time winners, they believe out of, uh, they, they operate out of a belief system based in fear not in abundance and that fear component i think is very interesting in in sociology and well behavioral psychology if if we look at it at a darwinistical uh, point of view our brain is hardwired to be more sensitive to fear than to anything positive actually bad news travels six times faster than good news it is because when we were still in our case, being hunted by tigers and snakes, the person who would be afraid of every stick because it could have been a snake, well, was more likely to pass on his genes to the next generation. And as such, we are all hardwired to be very sensitive to fear. So the fear buttons we have, we all have, biologically wired, are very interesting for marketing purposes, sales purposes, political campaign purposes, and in, in that sense, I, when I read the statement, I think it could be said that it is not we, but more our unconscious mind, which is steering our conscious decisions, who grants leadership. It is the unconscious mind who is actually at work and not really our consciousness. And as such, I also think it's not our subjective um, judgment about the skills of the leaders, but it's more our fear-based perception of the fear-based reality painted by those leaders. Because in my opinion, the reality is always perceived. So there is always a color in front of the, the, the reality. 
So if we look at it from that point of view, we could, we could ask ourselves, what's the fundamental difference between the leaders who just seize power and the leaders who cunningly use psychological tricks to eventually seize power? I think it's an interesting way to look at it at an individual uh, part. And having said that, that I think the, the, the question which was raised in the topic as well, I think, yes, we are being fooled by the verbalizations of those teams. Yes, we are being fooled by the power of psychology. We are every day, and it's not necessarily a problem if it's not necessarily something bad, but I think it's something we should be conscious about, and the voters hence should be conscious about when voting. It should almost be something like a disclaimer. If you vote, you should know that fear has been used in this political campaign. <laughs> this is the effect of fear, you know? So. I think it's interesting to have your your visions and opinions about that part as well. Thank you. I think that's that's really very very interesting. I've uh, I've been presented with four really very interesting introductions. Quite where we take this conversation now. I'm really I'm excited to know myself in a sense. Can I just pick up on one strand? It's it's very interesting. If I take that final idea about the the consciousness, I take the point about confidence that was raised by Manuela. I, pick up the point around integrity. There's something in there about the characteristic of leadership that you're getting at. And I just wonder in the context of the question we're asking, do you, do you see that the, the nature of the leader has necessarily changed in, in your experience of working in organizations, working with people over the last what, 10, 15, 20 years, however long you've been working in that? Or is the nature of leadership a constant as you observed it? Um, I ask because I'm, I'm really interested to know whether the point raised by Jean-Pierre about this external environment impacting now upon the thoughts of leaders has actually changed the kind of dialogue between the followers and the leaders themselves. And that those issues of the emotional intelligence that Manuela picked up, the idea of humility, et cetera, are they much more to the fore now than perhaps the idea of the old sort of charismatic leader, that natural leader, all the, the very loudness of the leadership that we've assumed in the past? Um, a rather long question, but I'd be really interested to get reactions to that. I, I wonder if Manuel, can I just start with yourself? Because you, you really you brought up that issue of confidence and humility, etc. So. Yeah, of course. Um, I think you made a very, very good point. And uh, have leaders changed over the past twenty years? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, because I think they increasingly leaders in organizations, especially, but also in politics, have different tools at hand that they used to have 20, 15, 10 years ago. Um, in politics, for example, different platforms to, to engage with different audiences, different segments, talk to different segments of their voting population in a way that they want to be talked to, in a way that they will understand, and that would play tricks and play on their fear and so on. In organizations, I think that type of leadership has not changed that much, but also leaders have to respond increasingly to um, an audience, whether that's employees or the wider population that knows a lot more and is more empowered. And increasingly, we are, for example, in certain sectors, especially accepting less and less hierarchies. And we want to move towards you know, more diversity, but also more networks, uh, collaboration. We want to be um, uh, taken into consideration a little bit more. And, uh, you know, there has been programs of reverse mentoring in, in large organizations and so on. Have they worked? Have they not? Not so much in my experience, but at least we are talking about it. We've been running now courses on unconscious biases and second generation biases for 10 years. Has much changed? No, but at least we're having that conversation. And, and so a little bit, yes, things have changed. Leaders have more attend. You know, the, the point of confidence is really important and there isn't a lot of... Uh, of um, um, work that I think is done to, to improve that. Many of us um, actually don't want to be leaders. If you look at history, um, 
often the best leaders did not want to become leaders. They were dragged into it. If you think of kings, but also some politicians and so on, they happen to uh, become leaders in, 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 their, in their fields. Many of us, and I think research says it's about 70 to 80 percent of, of the population suffers from low self-confidence, although we try to boost ourselves and all of that and power and so on. But we tend to have lower self-confidence than we think. And, and, and 70 to 80 percent of those people, of us, of me, also suffer from what is called imposter syndrome. And it, it hits a lot of the population, especially um, it hits the highest level of business and education. And so that, you know, self-doubt, am I doing the right thing? And am I really as competent as I should be? Am I giving the right answer? Um, often doesn't really help. And also it backfires because actually that's the more, you know, perhaps arrogant person in the room get away with that role or, 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 or that um, uh title or whatever. And so uh, I think there is a lot of work to do around that as well, around confidence, but also how do we respond to, to ourselves when we feel we're not, and this is especially actually hitting women, yeah. uh, yeah. when we, we think we're not good enough for that role. I mean, very often I've seen women not going for the role. This is a very known fact because they didn't think they could do it or they were 100% good at it. And, and, and often um, men go for it, even if they're probably 60% good at it, you know, or they have yeah. 60% of the skills required. Why is that? Are there enough studies on human nature and the difference between how the female and male mind work? And why don't we have enough female leaders as well? So that's, the, you know, that's a whole other topic. But the point about confidence, I think it's, it's, it's very important and how things have changed. Yes and no, but at least we're talking about a lot of the things that could help driving yes. that change. And another important element that, um, again, in organizations in recent years we've been discussing a lot is AQ, adaptability yeah. quotient, and how we can actually foster that. There is a natural resistance as human we have to change. We don't want change. You know, we, we, we try to resist, whether that's environmental reasons and, and, and we need to, to change our car or change the way we live our life and, and, and you know, um, pay whatever for our electricity bills or use electricity to um, change in organizations. I don't yeah. want to do things differently. I don't want to use that new software. How do we change yeah. that? Um, at least we're having that conversation, which I think That's is probably great. It's really interesting. If I just take the, the point about conference, I take the point about fear Mattia was talking about. Uh, I refer very much back to one of my favorite books, which is The Psychology of Military Incompetence which I think is one of the best management training books ever. Um, but those issues, imposter syndrome is at the heart of that. Um, very, very important issues. I wonder, Jan, just hearing that, you, you posed a series of questions at the very start. Do you have any reflections to the, the questions you posed at the start in relation to the discussion that we've been having over the last half hour or so? Well, you know, it's good to have more communication, but l let me go back to this uh, climate change uh, issue. We, we need a vision about climate change, right? Everybody knows that the shift to a cleaner energy economy won't happen overnight. And it will require, require tough choices by leaders. Personally, I, I really believe that now, more than ever before, we need to connect dots between issues like as discussed today during the conference, uh, dots between climate, poverty, energy, food and water. And these issues cannot be addressed in isolation. And you can communicate about it, but we may, as followers, we may expect from leaders that they really act. Again, a vision without action is a nightmare. Yeah, very good. Oh, I wonder, Matteo, do, do, I really it's interested in uh, Jean-Pierre and Matteo's view. It's if you if you link the idea of we had the discussion about the SDGs, the discussion about the need for adaptive um, sort of leadership. Do you see Jean-Pierre this coming essentially from a political um, arena, which is then imposed, um, or do you see it coming from within? I, I'm I'm straight very much by what Matthew was talking about, fear driving much leadership. If the fear of there is about, if that binds or limits the scope of what you're going to lead, then that would suggest that somebody else needs to ex act externally 
to move businesses on so that they take responsibility around those very issues you were talking about? Well, um, just a couple of remarks. I mean, a few, just a couple of seconds. Uh, the question of integrity, as, uh, as you mentioned, um, is, is quite important because uh, what we do, what leaders do, get um, very short uh, visibility. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it goes on internet and it's, uh, you know, it spreads everywhere. And the question of integrity is, um, do I do what I say? Most of the time is this, okay? And the problems we have, you were, you were talking about uh, Angela Merkel, she said a certain number of things and finally she did the reverse, okay? Um, okay, uh, so that's the subject of integrity. The, the One other subject which is quite in, very interesting in terms of leadership is the question of power, the question of fear. Fear is one of the emotions that we, that, we, uh, that we have. And um, power reading, the ability to identify uh, powerless or powerful people, okay, is one of the characteristics of the leader uh, at the end. Okay, because if, if you can read uh, the power within a team, then you will be, um, uh, you know, you will be the true leader of the team at the end. Yeah. Um, okay. Back to your question um, on, uh, on refugees. Well, refugees, as per the definition of the United Nations, didn't have any... Um, educational uh, programs within refugees camp, okay? And that's what the RET, the Refugees Education Trust, in collaboration with the UNHCR, uh, you know, has put in place in all refugees camp, okay? Um, not to say that at the moment, uh, the number of refugees in the world is very close to 100 million people. Yeah, so that's huge. Okay. okay, but what we do, very short, what we do yeah. is to educate the children within uh, the refugees um, camp because there was absolutely, and what we have are the the um, uh, the, the, the the soldier, you know, the, the children soldier, as we call it, uh, in educate special educational things. Yeah. So we are confronted with the question of fear because if they do it, it's because they fear something. Okay? Yeah. They are reacting to an aggression. Yeah. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm conscious that I, I would love to continue this. I'm conscious we have only two minutes left before we have to stop streaming. Yes, um, we I just, <laughs> just okay. wondered if, um, if there were any final comments anyone would like to make. I, I, have, I have a question, serious question about you know picking up on, on two of the strands of conversations, whether... We're talking about the granting of leadership, and is leadership something often because the followers of themselves opted out of, of taking on a position, and they're, they're, they're rather handing over leadership to other people? Uh, Matty, you were suggesting that, that that sort of psychological awareness um, can be used uh, to manipulate people. It's, um, well, yes, and I think, I think you grant you have... leadership is something. I, I don't think we grant leadership. Yeah. At the end. Okay. Yeah. It's the unconsciousness, but I think Jan's uh, point was very valid about integrity alone doesn't make you a leader. Without integrity, you will never be one. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I really think, and Jean-Pierre, you're right. For me, integrity is the cohesion between your agenda and your values. If you, I, I call it the integrity check. I let them look in the agenda and then you can see how is your integrity going. I believe that the, the generation, the millennials and the generation Z, they're much more sensitive to that in their leaders, sure. uh, I feel. So there is much more awareness about it, maybe uh, because of social media, because there is much more awareness about, well, visibility about everything that's happening that used to be happening in hindsight, uh, yes. in uh, closed door, behind closed doors. But I, I truly believe that is only through integrity. And that's actually also my point about the fear if you are a, integer, uh, a leader who is acting out of integrity, 
it is a leader acting out of abundance, about it, uh, out of a belief in something better and not out of a belief of we should eradicate that yes, population so we yeah. have some space, you know, that kind That's of thing. Very good. Look, I, I think we've finished the session, but can I say thank you for ending on that point of consensus? I think all, all of you have, have referred back to this issue of integrity. You referred back also to the, the importance of integrity for the fellowship. Of, uh, of leaders. And I think as a point of consensus, that's a really useful point to end on. So could I thank you very much? I'm sorry we didn't have at least another hour to carry on. Um, I had so many <laughs> questions arising from the points that I made. But I'm, well, very not, I'm continuous. continuous. <laughs> 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 but that's really great. So look, if, if you don't mind, I'll now stop streaming and then we can um, we can continue the conversation. Thank you.